just going to start uh, with a little background on Ripple as a company and the work that we're doing in CBDC, and then we can get more into uh, the platform that we've built, and, and we're going to do a demo of that uh, for, for the audience here. So by way of background, uh, Ripple is an enterprise software company that leverages distributed ledger technology to offer a range of products uh, to licensed financial institutions. The company's uh, 10 years old. We're based in San Francisco. Uh, we have offices globally. And for the past decade, we are perhaps best known for having built a global cross-border payments, payments and messaging infrastructure network. Uh, that, that network is active across 70 some odd countries um, and 120 some odd currency pairs uh, with 300 regulated finan financial institutions, currently moving billions of dollars uh, globally. Uh, we built that network on the XRP ledger. The XRP ledger is a, a public permissionless blockchain. It's been in production uh, for a decade and uh, it's got a great track record of being a very robust core technology. So we've taken that, that solution, that, that ledger, and we've architected a private version of that public ledger. And that, that forms the base of our CBDC platform. On top of that ledger, we've built a series of applications for different stakeholders in the CBDC ecosystem. And under the supervision of the central banking authorities or monetary authorities, designated stakeholders can inter interact with CBDC and manage it according to the requirements of the nation. So that's what we've built. Um, we have been pursuing our CBDC strategy as a business for the past several years, and I'm pleased to say that we've had uh, very good proof points back from the market to include a number of industry uh, awards and recognitions that we've received from different third-party analyst groups. And uh, nothing is more important to us um, than the partnerships that we've built with different countries. We're, we're honored to be working globally with uh, many central banks. I think we've, we've publicly released uh, six uh, governments that we're working with. Most recently, we announced a partnership with the National Bank of Georgia. We're honored to be working, working with them. Uh, we have uh, several others that we're working with uh, privately. Um, all of those projects are uh, unique and different. For us, um, they're a fabulous opportunity to go in and learn about the country and um, offer our solution um, to, uh, to their CBDC uh, objectives. The uh, Ripple platform is, uh, leverages the foundational attributes of distributed ledger technology security, resilience, privacy, auditability, and enables uh, monetary authorities to uh, manage the full life cycle of their digital currency. Um, think about traditional money, uh, money management and printing um, as it's historically done. We've borrowed those concepts um, to enable central banks to mint, manage, uh, distribute, transact, uh, burn CBDC and onboard participants into the network so that they can interact with CBDC as well. That might be commercial banks or other designated stakeholders. Uh, the platform enables uh, different versions of programmability, and programmability uh, means different things um, from a technical standpoint um, as well as operationally. But there's a lot of native core functionality on the ledger. And I highlight that because a lot of times when we talk about programmability, people immediately think of smart contracts. We do have a fully EVM compliant smart contract functionality where that's necessary, but it's oftentimes it may not be necessary. In fact, at times it could introduce unnecessary risk to the ecosystem. So the ledger has a lot of core functionality that would enable programmability around payments um, that can oftentimes meet the needs of um, different, different use cases. The platform is uh, very low energy use. It's, uh, a, a product of our unique um, consensus mechanism that uh, is not proof of work or proof of stake and, and highly consumptive. I um, mean, we think that's important. When you think about uh, retail CBDC, potential volume tra of transactions that will be required at scale, um, we think energy, uh, energy usage is a very important topic and it's a, it's a point that we like to highlight. 
Um, obviously, you know, I mentioned our history as a company and the ledger having a decade in production. We see that as a key attribute uh, to our credibility in telling our story. Over the past decade, uh, we've built up uh, real-world enterprise infrastructure integration expertise, and, um, and, the, and the technology that we are leveraging has been in the market uh, in a real-world environment for, for that amount of time. Um, and we think that's a distinguishing uh, feature to highlight. I was interested earlier listening to um, Evelyn Whitlock's of the ECB talk about different ways that uh, the digital euro will be accessible in the eurozone. Um, I think she mentioned three different uh, ways. One was uh, through an ECB-issued wallet. One would be through a bank-issued wallet. And then uh, the third was sort of on a card concept. And when I heard that, I internalized the complexity of that ecosystem and what will be required. And that's what we think about at Ripple. We think about a CBDC as a full ecosystem that encompasses different instruments, different actors, and ultimately different use cases. So when we think about different instruments, yes, we're talking about central bank digital currency. But we're also talking about private money. We're talking about stablecoin, tokenized deposit. We might be talking about native cryptocurrencies. All of these things we anticipate coexisting in some fashion in a mature marketplace, subject to regulatory frameworks uh, that allow for them to interoperate along different corridors. But we're building for that, we're building for that future. Um, Different actors, we have direct participants that will hold accounts at the central bank. We have indirect banks that might, uh, might uh, access CBDC through, uh, through those, um, direct, those, those other commercial banks with central banking accounts. Um, we anticipate non-bank financial institutions having access to CBDC in some capacity. Developers building applications on top of CBDC platforms subject to the controls of a central bank. Um, and then ultimately merchants and end users, people transacting at the counter, um, being, having wallets and being able to spend, uh, spend CBDC and receive CBDC. That's a, that's a mature ecosystem. Um, and that, that, that is, uh, there's a lot of actors in that ecosystem. And it's, we, we think that that is the direction of travel um, that, that we're on. Um, the primary use cases that, that, we, that we see and envision that are really foundational to making that work, I think of three of them. Uh, one is domestic retail payments as a replacement for cash. Another one is, uh, is cross-border payments, which we have a, uh, a lengthy history in. And then finally, uh, interbank wholesale settlement. Um, obviously, there are a ton of use cases, many of which we wouldn't even contemplate today. But we're building with that foundation, and we think those three uh, use cases are going to be, at least in the early beginnings of adoption, very important. So the platform that we've built, and, and I'm displaying an overview of the architecture, the heart of it, the heart of it sits in the, in the middle here in the ledger. And that is, um, as I said earlier, a private version of the public XRP ledger. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a ledger that um, is highly performant, um, it's scalable, and as I said, uh, uh, probably for the second or third time now, it's been in production for a decade, which I think is, is super valuable. On top of that issue, we built a series of applications that enable different stakeholders to interact with that ledger as, as appropriate. So we have an issuer. An issuer is an application designed for the monetary authority. And it enables the monetary authority to manage the full life cycle of the digital currency, and including onboarding participants and distributing that CBDC to participants in the network that they designate. Some of those participants might be commercial banks or other financial institutions. And we envision their access of the, of the uh, ledger through what we're calling the operator. The operator is an application that will enable, it's an enterprise application that will enable those stakeholders to move CBDC for different purposes, maybe liquidity management, maybe, um, maybe settlement, using CBD settlement uh, to settle securities, um, or, or passing it in or on to their, to their consumers in a retail wallet, um, whatever their business cases might be. Um, and then we also, we also uh, have a strategy around wallets. We have some wallets internally at Ripple that, that we've built, and we're also partnering with some of the best-in-class wallet providers in the market. Um, 
partnering is, is, is core to the strategy because I think the reality is that um, delivering a CBDC at this stage is, is really beyond the means of almost any one company in the market. There's so much that goes into a CBDC from the technology to the legal and regulatory to the implementation, to the infrastructure, to the maintenance. And so we find that partners play a key role in that. And, and, and certainly wallet providers are a critical component of the ecosystem. Um, we have many wallet, wallet partners that we work with because every market is different. And the technology of choice in one environment might not be suitable in another environment. So we look to find the best solution for that particular partner. And then I've already mentioned some of these, uh, some of these attributes of the CBDC platform. Um, one, one that I'll highlight is uh, around the native functionality. And I, I talked a little bit about programmability earlier. The XRP ledger has a lot of native functionality um, that it, it was designed specifically for issuing currencies. I mean, it has, it has key attributes that will enable things like uh, tracking transactions, which are important to uh, regulators. Um, and it will facilitate auditability and compliance in ways that we think will add, will add uh, to financial stability at the end of the day as these, as these products are scaled. And so we think some of those native features are, uh, are super compelling aspects of the, of the, of the solution. Um, and then obviously it's a DLT. So typical DLT type uh, solution includes things like atomic settlement, um, you know, scalability, real-time payments, and all of those other attributes. And that is an overview on the background of the, of the ledger and the platform. Lauren is going to talk through a little bit further detail on some of the, on some of the attributes and then uh, run through the demo. Hello. Okay, it's on. Uh, hi, I'm Lauren Berta. Uh, I'm on the CBDC product team at Ripple. And I own the issuer product, which we're looking at now. Uh, this is specifically for our central bank partners um, to go through that process of minting CBDC and then, of course, enabling their treasury process and actually ensuring the funds minted are the proper amount. And then they have the proper people governing who those funds are then allocated to. In a wholesale model, that's probably some sort of account manager ensuring each of the commercial bank participants are receiving the actual amount that they've signed up for. And then tracking that the amount they've received is how much they're allocating, uh, whether it be direct distribution or a second issuance on top of that uh, to the end retail users. How do we do this? So on the issuer application, we focus on onboarding. Uh, we have basically a structure that enables uh, either retail users or those, again, commercial bank or financial institution participants to request uh, to hold a CBDC in their wallet. And we also enable then an approval process by the issuer to decide if they're going to be able to hold that or not based on their risk portfolio. We focus on an auditable history of all actions taken within the app. This is everything to do with money movement, but also everything to do with the setup going into that. We have roles that govern who is able to do what. Um, being a product manager, I don't want to guess what our central bankers, what kind of patterns they're gonna govern who is able to do what in this. So we have a really flexible permissions uh, system, which actually enables central bankers to decide for themselves what kind of roles exist and who is then able to do what through those roles. Um, we also offer um, a number of security parameters in the issuer platform. Uh, everything is multi-signature and it's not MPC, it's signatures on ledger. So we're working to make sure that, you know, the access of those signatures, there's a governance structure surrounding that. So no one gets the keys when they are not supposed to. Um, and then we also offer a feature surrounding account freezing. So like I said, you might have an external retail user that was approved to hold CBDC, but over time their risk portfolio changes and for any reason you need to actually freeze their wallet. Uh, we enable that feature so that as time goes on you have the flexibility to do so. 
Our second application is the operator. This is built specifically for commercial banks or uh, direct participants in a wholesale CBDC who are responsible for, again, accepting that minted currency from the central bank and then managing the probably thousands of retail users involved. Um, this is really all about uh, scale. Um, it's a multi-currency platform, so you know, a commercial bank will probably handle multiple CBDCs for their retail users. Um, and it offers a lot of you know, extra features in customer onboarding. Um, there's a lot of plugins uh, from some of our partners as well. And we're hoping to grow all those in the future as well as the network sort of um, enlargens. Um, and then we have our wallets and end user applications. So of course, um, we then have the retail users who are the real customers of a CBDC. Um, in our current wallet ecosystem, we have a big focus on offline payments. That's of course very important regardless of the jurisdiction. Um, and then we also have a number of custody solutions we're working towards. And what I mean by that is, you know, retail users uh, can be worried, like we've talked about privacy, they want to actually own their CBDC. And so we're piloting some different options on how to make sure uh, people are actually able in charge, or people are remain in charge of their funds. Um, so from there, I'm going to get into our demo. And so this is our issuer application. Um, and it, this is our application we've built specifically, specifically for central bankers uh, issuing CBDC. I'm going to, ooh, we lost Wi-Fi. Oh no, I think the Wi-Fi just went down. <laughs> so basically getting into it, um, like I brought up at the beginning, here, I can move to, there we go, okay. So, going quickly through this, we govern uh, this application with a number of roles. So I just logged in as a system admin, and we basically have, I've created all of these roles within my own tenant. Apologies, this keeps popping up. Um, we have an auditor, it's a person I created who is able to basically Ah. Okay, we're going to go to the slides. So, <laughs> we, apologies for that. So, as an admin, we have a number of um, roles which govern what people are able to do within the application. You can see here I have what I've called a chief cashier. A lot of people, this is a treasury officer. It's going to govern the actual minting of the CBDC. Um, they control, you know, what operational accounts that ends up in and then what account managers um, are in charge based on what external customers they need to allocate that CBDC to. Um, here you can see some of the permissions uh, that they're able to choose from. We ensure that basically um, as they go through this, we have different people who can initiate payments. And this becomes especially applicable when we get to machine users, right? Because to scale any sort of issuance process, we're going to need some automation. So here you can see this is an auditor. They're able to read all accounts, but they can't action anything. Um, some of our machine users, they're able to initiate payments, but then you need extra um, permissions to sign for payments. Uh, protecting the keys is really a major focus of this application. We have an account structure, um, and I'm going to move through here. And you can see here that we have at the bottom are two signers. So these are cashiers who are actually added to the account, permission to sign for minting transactions um, and handle that day to day. So uh, next I'm gonna move into a transactor. And here, when you log in as a transactor, you're able to see all of the transactions which are pending your approval. We have that multi-signature process flow, uh, which requests uh, you sign with your key. We have a couple different custody solutions based on central banker's uh, choice. And when you go to sign, so for example, I'm going to, I have a payment request at the top. Um, here we're creating a new mint request. Um, 
basically you choose the account which you want to mint to and then provide the amount. My currency is called BER. When you create that transaction, it requests the signers, you add your signature, and you can see here it's gone into the ready state. This is us basically, the ledger knows uh, who the signers are, uh, what the public keys are, so we're basically building a package that we're gonna ship to the ledger for clearing. Um, so we hit submit at that bottom right, and this actually uh, submits this. You can see the transaction on the top says settled. Uh, this all happens on Ledger. Um, you can see at the top, we have our total minted, uh, total on standby, operational, and in circulation. Uh, these are the different account types that outline uh, that treasury process I had brought up. So our total minted is just everything. That's all the BER in existence. Um, we treat our standby accounts like bank vaults. So it's minted currency, but it's maybe not ready for prime time. The operational accounts are sort of like a bank teller's cash register, um, owned by account managers who know exactly what external customers the CBDC needs to be allocated to. And then you also have total in circulation that's held by end user wallets. Um, and yeah, that's going to be our demo. If you'd like to see a live demo, um, I have it on my computer. We can do it at the booth. Thank you. I think we may have a few minutes still for questions, if, if there are any five minutes, three minutes questions from the audience. Any stumps, stumper, yes. I have a question on how the platform can interact with other clients. So let's say if one country uses a platform, can they customize how much they want to be interoperable with another country's CBDC platform using both Ripple or a similar solution? Yeah, so that would be, so we basically, a lot of our central bankers are interested in permissioned blockchains. Um, we have a bridge model that uh, Ripple's sort of proof of concept team working out and it just came out with um, sort of an MVP that basically is a model where we have this, it's called a federated model, but it's, it's a validator who's able to uh, check two different permissioned blockchains can clear or it can watch the clearing of a transaction, say in USD on a US CBDC blockchain, uh, do the actual movement across a bridge and then watch it clear. Um, it would be still USD on maybe the Euro chain. And then from there we could do, when we have a market maker, it could go cross currency, right? So uh, that kind of graduated validator, um, it's a node. And it would be basically a scheme. There would be multiple of those. And these two countries could you know, come together and decide to have a validator do that on two different chains. But of course, interoperability also means a bunch of different things. Cross-currency on the same chain is very easy. The XRP ledger has a decentralized exchange um, that's been doing that for years. Um, and when it comes down to it, I think a lot of that will happen at the commercial bank level as well. The operator application we had brought up is multi-currency. We're expecting commercial banks to accept multiple CBDCs. Um, and all of this is enabled uh, by the XRP ledger today. So would the CBDC ledger be able to talk to uh, Ripple, the public ledger, yep. and RippleNet? Okay. Yep, that's exactly the idea with the federated model. Hi. Uh, can you please describe the privacy guarantees of the system? Uh, does anyone that has access to the DLT can see all the transactions or is there something that preserves privacy? Yeah, yeah, so uh, privacy, I mean, there's, again, a range of what central banks are requesting there. Um, one thing we've seen is the idea that if they're on a permission chain, um, they actually want a login to be able to see all the transactions. Another idea is using a decentralized identity to actually wrap transactions on mainnet. So on the, the main public chain, right, at the moment you can see the public key. And we've found through, I mean, uh, talking to I'm sure TRM labs or companies similar to that, pretty quickly you can figure out who owns the public key. Um, with a decentralized identity, which we're, um, which is something that's being proof of concept on the XRP ledger, um, you basically would wrap it with sort of a stamp of approval 
from maybe your commercial bank who holds most of our KYC profiles today, um, or a central bank if it's a retail model. And while you would still be able to see the settlement or the, the closing of that transaction, you wouldn't see the public key, you wouldn't see the value. This would all be sort of masked in the fact that it's been approved by that commercial bank partner or whoever is responsible in that country. Um, in other countries, they do want to remain uh, more open, we've seen. Um, the sort of, you know, public address is something that they want to keep safe, um, but it's not something they find um, they need to explicitly like wrap or hide. So it, that kind of privacy model is still being worked out, but we've found a few different options that, uh, as described. Thank you.